speaker is ready yes namaskar so swagatam kem cho adabars a very good afternoon aap sabhi ka prl ke amrit vyakhyan mein swagat hai abhinandan hai a very warm welcome from me anil bharadwaj for prl ka amrit vyakhyan today is the 73rd vyakhyan of the 75 episodes series of vyakhyan which is being organized as a part of prl's 75 years of legacy and history in fundamental physics and space sciences established in the year 1947 by the father of indian space program dr vikram sarabhai the prl's platinum jubilee coincides with india's 75 years of independence hence it's a joint celebration of the development of science and technology in india by prl under the banner of prl ka amrit vyakhya today we have yet another very distinguished vyakhyan karta with us sir jayaram changalur who is a distinguished professor and currently director of tata institute of fundamental research in mumbai and he is going to give the vyakhyan on galaxy evolution the atomic hydrogen perspective we greatly thank and appreciate professor jairaman changlur for kindly accepting our invitation and to be with us today on this vyakhyan which is a part of prl's pratam jubilee as well as azadi ka amrit mahotsav i would now request my colleague professor nandita shivastha to kindly introduce today's vyakhyan karta uh, professor jairaman jairam to the panel on the webex as well as those who have joined us live on the prl's youtube channel over to you nandita thank you professor bharadwaj uh, it is an honor and privilege to introduce today's speaker uh, professor jairam chengalu distinguished professor and director tata institute of fundamental research mumbai professor jairam chengalu obtained his btech in electrical engineering from the indian institute of technology kanpur and obtained phd in astronomy from cornell university following a post doctoral position in the uh, from netherlands institute for radio astronomy he joined national center for radio astrophysics pune in 1996 professor chengalur's research interest include studies of galaxy structure and evolution the interstellar medium of our galaxy as well as development of astronomical instrumentation and software He is a fellow of the Indian Academy of Sciences, the National Academy of Sciences, and the Indian National Science Academy. He also received Sri Hari Om Ashram Pradit Dr. Vikram Sarabhai Research Award in 2009 for his research work in radio astrophysics, particularly towards understanding dark matter in dwarf galaxies and characteristics of the interstellar medium using the giant meter radio telescope. Professor Chengalur is holding the chair of the National Committee of the International Astronomical Union and is actively involved in outreach activities of NCRA and uh, Public Outreach and Education Committee of the Astro Astronomical Society of India. Uh, his recent uh, article on radio astronomy and the giant meter wave radio telescope published in 2018 which was originally written for school science magazine Uh, I wonder by Aziz Azim Premji University has been later reproduced in resonance in 19 in 2018 and I recommend all of you to use and uh, use it read it and uh, disseminate this because it's a very interesting and a delight to read uh, we are indeed very thankful to professor Chengalur for accepting our invitation to deliver the vyakhyan at PRL without much further ado I now invite Now, uh, Professor Chengalu to deliver the seventy-third Vyakhyan on galaxy evolution, the atomic hydrogen perspective. Professor Chengalu, please. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much, Professor Bharadwaj and Professor Shrivastava, uh, both for the invitation to give uh, this talk. It's a great honor uh, to be part of uh, PRL's seventy-five uh, year celebration in the form of these seventy-five uh, Vyakhyans, and. Uh, I thank also professor shrivastava for that very very kind uh, introduction so um, let me now uh, just share my slides
Yeah, we can see your slide. Gentlemen, you are muted. Are you muted? No, I'm not. Now we can hear you. Yes. Okay. Somehow we, we missed uh, the beginning. Let me just uh, start again. I am muted. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes. And I hope you can see my screen also. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. So hopefully this time it'll work. Yeah, so <laughs> as I was saying, I would like to talk about galaxy evolution, the atomic uh, hydrogen perspective. And uh, this is work done almost uh, entirely with um, the giant meter wave radio telescope, where two of whose antennas you can see uh, in this image. And I'll say a little bit about the giant meter wave radio telescope as we go along. And um, I'd also like to acknowledge, uh, you know, uh, to, uh, to two PhD students who, uh, whose work I'll be presenting over here, Apurva Bera and Aditya Chaudhary, who's uh, really done a lot of the really heavy lifting uh, on these projects that I will talk about. And I would also like to acknowledge uh, uh, Nisim Kanekar, who's done really much of the heavy lifting on this project. So with Without further ado, then let me start. Um, and let me start not by talking about um, atomic hydrogen, but just giving a little bit of uh, background to introduce the jargon uh, that I will be using um, and you know, to just set the scene. So we are going to be looking at very uh, distant galaxies. And because uh, light has a finite travel time, it means that the objects that we are going to observe today uh, are seen as they were in the distant past uh, because it took the light that much time to reach us. Uh, we see the sun as it was eight and a half minutes ago and galaxies which are, uh, you know, uh, many um, uh, mega parsecs away, we see them as they were, uh, you know, in the very, very distant past. So we're going to be talking about galaxies that are, you know, giga light years away from us. And the fact that uh, light has a finite uh, travel time allows us to study the evolution of galaxies because the more distant population of galaxies that you look at, the earlier stage of the universe that you are probing. And so by studying galaxies at different distances, galaxy populations at different distances, it allows you to study the evolution of the population of galaxies. And that's exactly what we will be doing in this uh, talk today. Uh, the other th uh, uh, thing I'd like to remind you is that the universe expands, and because the universe is expanding, light from distant objects is observed at a longer wavelength than the light uh, than the wavelength it had when it was emitted, and this change in wavelength between the emission and the uh, observing time uh, is called the redshift Z. So Z is defined in the way that I've put it down over here below. It is the ratio of the observed wavelength by the emitted wavelength minus one. And uh, this is the parameter, the basic parameter that we will use to parameterize both distances and look back time uh, of whatever phenomena that we are talking about. So the higher the redshift, the more distant past that we are looking at, the more distant an object we are looking at. And uh, for those of you who are uh, sort of the experts in this field, I've just sort of mentioned that we will use a particular cosmology, the 737 cosmology, which will uh, which we will use to 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 sort of determine the relationship between the redshift and the distance and the look back time and so on. For those of you who are not um, you know subject experts, you could just uh, ignore that. All right, uh, so having said that background, let me uh, give you another little bit of background, which is of galaxies. What are galaxies? What are galaxies made of? So uh, traditionally, if you ask somebody, you know, what is a galaxy, or if you just ask the man on the street, what is a galaxy, the person on the street, they would tell you a galaxy is a collection of stars. And that is, you know, in many ways, the truth. Uh, if you look at the Milky Way, it has about uh, 10 to the 11 stars in it. And, that's the, you know, you look up in the sky, that's what you see most easily, the stars, the band of the Milky Way. 
But the galaxy, however, has many, many other constituents. Uh, it has, in particular, something called dark matter in it, which is actually the dominant matter content of the galaxy. It dominates over the normal baryonic uh, matter of the galaxy. The baryons are the normal kind of chemical elements that we uh, are used to dealing with, hydrogen, helium, so on and so forth. In addition uh, to the stars and the dark matter, the galaxy also has um, a medium between the stars, the interstellar medium. And this interstellar medium is predominantly atomic hydrogen and molecular hydrogen, gas, basically hydrogen, which is the most abundant element in the universe in either the atomic or the molecular form. And in addition, galaxies have many other trace components. It has ionized gas, it has dust, it has cosmic rays, it has magnetic fields, and so on and so forth. And all of these constituents actually play uh, an active role uh, in the evolution of the galaxy. So truly speaking, if you really want to understand fully how the galaxies form and evolve, you need to look at all of these if you want a really, really full picture of what's happening. Uh, and to just give you uh, an idea uh, of, you know, the fact that galaxies are multi-constituent, I'm showing you over here in the image uh, um, that, um, you know, a GMRT uh, image of the hydrogen in the galaxy, and that is what's shown in the red contours, and uh, the stars in the galaxy, which is made from an optical image, which is what you see in the black image in the background. Uh, and so you can see that these two uh, components actually um, trace uh, morphologically quite different bits of the galaxy. The hydrogen is, um, you know, in these galaxies at least, significantly more extended uh, than the stars. And these two galaxies are interacting, and you can see that the gravitational effect of the interaction is much more pronounced uh, in the atomic hydrogen component than it is in the stellar component. All right, uh, so that was what individual galaxies are made of. But if you uh, look at you know the universe as a whole and ask those, uh, ask how do these galaxies come about? How do the structures that we see in the universe come about? They are all believed to form through gravitational instabilities. That is, at very, very early times in the universe, the density of the uh, universe was not uh, exactly constant. There were very small fluctuations. There were regions of the universe which were slightly overdense, other regions which were slightly underdense. And these grow by gravitational instability. That is to say, in the dense regions, because the gravity is a little stronger over there, material flows into these dense regions, making them even denser. And similarly, the material will flow out of the underdense regions into the overdense regions, making the underdense regions even more underdense. And so that's a runaway process. And so if you have small fluctuations over time, they will grow to form much larger fluctuations. And indeed, they will grow to form the kind of galaxies and large scale structure that you see today. So the galaxies, if you look uh, around us and you ask, you know, how are the galaxies distributed in space? So the galaxies are not randomly uh, distributed in space. Um, they, you find them arranged in, uh, in larger structures. You find them, and that's what I'm showing you in the lower image over there, uh, that the uh, galaxies around us are in walls, in filaments, which are at the intersections of the walls. There are clusters at the intersection of the filaments, and so on. So basically, there's a coherent large-scale structure uh, of, the, of which the galaxies trace out in the universe. All right, so um, in that context, how do galaxies form and evolve? So basically what we believe happens is that in overdense regions, um, the dark matter effectively collapses to virialize to form dark matter halos. And the baryons, uh, which uh, can cool uh, by radiating uh, photons and losing their energy, so they cool and they collect at the center of the dark matter potential. And this is what then forms uh, cold gas, which in, it, so, which in turn will then collapse to form stars. And so this is how the first galaxies form. And these galaxies then grow and evolve over time. And they could do this in two uh, ways. Uh, they could grow by hierarchical merger, which is what I'm showing you in the upper image over there, that uh, time is flowing downwards from the top to the bottom. And uh, what happens is at the beginning, you have several small collapsed objects, and uh, they hierarchically merge to form larger and larger objects. And so this is one way in which galaxies could grow by basically just, um, you know, a, a merger of, small, of, of more and more dark matter halos, each of which has its own baryons to form bigger and bigger galaxies. The other way in which uh, the galaxy could grow is by accretion of gas. Uh, so the gas could fl continue to flow into the dark matter halos. And uh, there are two modes um, in which this typically happens. 
One in which the gas as it falls in is shock heated and ionizes. And so it's called hot accretion. It typically would then form a large ionized halo around the galaxy, which would gradually cool and collapse into the galaxy. Or you could have cold flows where the gas doesn't get shock heated, but instead it flows along filaments in the large scale structure and it flows all the way down into the galaxy to feed the growth of galaxies. And these cold flows are believed to be the dominant mode of gas accretion for galaxies uh, with mass less than about three times 10 to the 11 solar masses. Right? All right, uh, so um, now let me start talking about how stars in these galaxies begin to form. What is it that we know about star formation in galaxies? Right? So we had the big picture of how galaxies themselves form. They formed by either this hierarchical merger or gas flowing in. But then how then do we get the stars and things that we see today? And so I'm showing you over here, um, you know, uh, observationally what we know about star formation in galaxies. And uh, if you look at the upper panel over here uh, on the vertical uh, uh, axis, we have uh, the star formation rate in a galaxy uh, in solar masses per year. And on the horizontal axis, we have the mass of that galaxy. So each point over here is a, is a galaxy where you have, you know, both its stellar mass and, you know, its current star formation rate. And you can see that a vast majority of the galaxies actually lie along a fairly narrow locus in this plane of star formation rate and stellar mass. So, you know, given a, a st current stellar mass of a galaxy, you can predict the rate at which it would be forming stars because um, there's a very narrow band along which it lies. And this is called um, the main sequence of star formation. And all of this information basically comes from deep optical surveys, which you do with large telescopes. And from these surveys, you could measure the mass of the star and the star formation rate. And you could make a plot like this and you could realize that the star formation rate and the current stellar mass are quite tightly correlated. And so that's an interesting correlation, but of course it doesn't tell you anything about the gas content of the galaxy. And the gas is of course the thing from which the stars are forming. So you'd like to know something about it eventually. But you know, what you've learned already is fairly interesting that, uh, you know, that the star forming galaxies typically lie along a line in the log star formation, star formation rate plane, stellar mass star formation rate plane, which is called the galaxy main sequence. And the bulk of the star formation in the universe happens in these main sequence galaxies. The other thing which you could learn from these optical uh, surveys is that this main sequence is actually evolving. If I look back at early times, uh, for a given stellar mass, the galaxy actually is forming stars at a much faster rate. Right? So the amplitude of the main sequence is increasing with redshift. And it's increasing quite dramatically. It increases by about a factor of 10 between a redshift of 0 to a redshift of 1, which is of the order of a, a giga year or so ago. The slope of the relationship also evolves slightly, but really the most pronounced effect is um, the evolution of the amplitude. So that basically means that a given stellar mass, um, you know, the um, uh, a galaxy uh, uh, at a redshift of one actually forms stars much, much more rapidly than it does today. You could also sort of take an integrated look at this. You integrate over the main sequence, for example, and you ask in a typical volume of the universe, how is the star formation rate changing as the universe evolves? And this, again, is something which has been known for more than a decade, maybe close to two decades, in fact, now, that if you look at this quantity, which is called um, the um, uh, star formation rate density, which is basically the star formation rate uh, integrated over all the galaxies uh, in that volume, uh, you see that actually it evolves very dramatically with redshift. So as the universe evolves, um, uh, if you start at very early uh, times at a redshift of about eight, the star formation rate per unit volume of the universe is quite low. Then it picks up to a roughly broad peak somewhere between redshifts of about one and three. There's more or less flat plateau where you have, uh, you know, stars forming at a very, very uh, rapid rate. And then somewhere around a redshift of one, um, the star formation rate per unit volume in the universe again begins to fall. And I'll again remind you, when I say per unit volume in the universe, what we mean is that you take all the galaxies in that volume and you integrate the star formation uh, rate in all those galaxies. 
So, you know, uh, this is now a very, very well established uh, observation by multiple people using multiple methods. They, it's been quite well established that there's a very rapid rate of star formation rate per unit volume, a broad peak between redshifts about 1.3, and a very sharp decline between redshifts of about one and the current epoch, which is a redshift of zero. Right. And that's, um, you know, you can see there's a very sharp fall between about one and zero. And um, this area, this a region between about a redshift of one and three, where you can see that the star formation rate is at its maximum, is actually uh, you know quite a dramatic period because about half of the stellar mass that you see in galaxies today has in fact formed at those redshifts. It's formed between the redshifts of uh, of one between one and three, and so this era uh, is sometimes called the epoch of galaxy assembly, or it's sometimes also called the galaxy cosmic noon, you know the high high peak of star formation in the galaxy. All right, so I said that, um, you know, uh, we know a lot about uh, the star formation rate. We don't know a whole lot about um, the gas in these galaxies. And um, that, you know, is an important lacunae because star formation happens by the collapse of, of, of gas to form stars. So if you really want to understand why uh, the star formation rate is evolving in this way, you'd like to understand what's happening to the gas. So, you know, uh, I've given over here a sort of cartoon model of our understanding of how stars form. Uh, broadly speaking, you have uh, atomic hyd hydrogen, which is the raw material for the star formation. It cools to form molecular hydrogen clouds. These molecular gas clouds cool further and fragment into stars, again, by gravitational instability. And this is a fairly complex process because once the stars form, uh, they begin to inject energy back into the interstellar medium, either from star formation or, the, or when they uh, explode a supernovae to form black holes. And this feedback could disrupt star formation altogether or it could um, you know, positively enhance it so that you have a second burst of star formation. The process is very complex. Um, but in summary, the idea is that to form uh, stars, you will definitely need uh, this reservoir of gas. In the absence of that gas, there will be no star formation. Uh, if you do have the gas, then you could try and sort of trace down this process by which it collapses, and you could try and then understand why stars are forming at a particular rate. So in summary, the you know, a full understanding of the star formation in galaxies requires us to also observe the cold gas components of both molecular and hydrogen. And uh, uh, hydrogen in a, is, uh, you know, the primary material out of which the stars form. So that's also, you know, in that sense, uh, a particularly important uh, piece of the puzzle. So now let's, you know, having looked at how stars, uh, you know, what we understand about star formation as the galaxies evolve, let's take a look at what we understand uh, is happening to the gas as galaxies evolve. All right, so let's look first at the cosmic evolution of the molecular gas in galaxies. Now, molecular gas, uh, it uh, can be traced. The molecular gas is primarily a molecular hydrogen, H2. Uh, H2 doesn't have a dipole moment, so it's very difficult for us um, to detect any electromagnetic radiation from it. And so molecular gas is typically traced using, you know, sort of uh, either the emission from CO or dust, both of which are typically associated with uh, H2. Uh, so, uh, CO surveys, which people have done, have typically limited sampling because it um, sort of costs a lot in telescope time uh, to detect CO uh, from a large sample of galaxies. Dust emission uh, is, uh, can be done faster, and so we have dust emission uh, uh, estimates of the molecular mass of galaxies for much larger samples, but it's also the conversion between the dust emission and the total molecular gas content is more indirect. The conversion from CO to H2 is also uh, sort of... Uh, not that straightforward, but the conversion from dust to, 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 to H2 is, you know, one step more indirect. But anyway, uh, you know, if you look at what the observations are telling us, and there have been a large number of surveys over the last, um, you know, five or six years, you can see that, um, you, you know, there's a broad similarity with what we saw with the star formation rate. So if you look at this plot, it has um, the molecular mass per unit volume of the universe on the vertical axis. You have the redshift on the horizontal axis. They've plotted it in the form of log of one plus the redshift. But, um, you know, it's basically redshift on the horizontal axis. And if you look at it, basically what is happening is that the molecular gas content increases uh, 
quite significantly, although the error bars at low redshift are large. They increase quite significantly between redshifts of about zero to two, and then uh, they decrease uh, as you go towards higher redshifts. So that's more or less consistent with the observed evolution of the star formation rate. So if you ask the question, you know, what is the gas depletion time? Uh, that is, you know, if I had some molecular gas which would collapse to form stars, how much time would it take for this entire mass of molecular gas to get depleted into the form of stars, right? That's called the depletion time. And in this case, it would simply be uh, the ratio of the uh, molecular mass to the star formation rate. Right. So the ratio of that is simply a time, which is the time it would take for all of that mass to become stars, assuming that the star formation rate proceeds at that steady rate. And uh, so this kind of plot uh, indicates that uh, across, um, you know, uh, cosmic time, the molecular gas depletion time is roughly constant. It doesn't change very much. The depletion time is about 0.5 to 1 giga year. That is, uh, you know, at the same steady rate, um, if I were able to convert uh, molecular gas to stars, uh, it would sort of uh, 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 reproduce um, the uh, star formation rate uh, density plots that we have observed in the optical. So that, uh, you know, uh, gives us uh, some understanding of how the molecular gas is getting converted into stars. It seems to be happening at a steady rate, um, you know, with a depletion time of about uh, 0.5 to 1 giga year. But to complete our understanding, we need to know how the atomic gas component of, of galaxies evolve. And so that brings me now to the heart of my talk. Uh, so how do we observe the atomic gas hydrogen in galaxies? Uh, so uh, we are looking at hydrogen, which is a proton and an electron, uh, which have spins and therefore magnetic moments. The spin of the proton and the electron in a hydrogen atom could be parallel or anti-parallel. And these two configurations have slightly different energy. It's a hyperfine transition, as uh, uh, many of you would be knowing. And so the atom can transition from one level to the other, accompanied by the emission or absorption of a photon. And the energy difference between these two levels is very, very small. It's only about the order of six microelectron volts, or in frequencies, it corresponds to 1420 megahertz, or a wavelength of 21 centimeters. So that falls very much in the radio regime. If you're looking at redshifted galaxies, uh, we know that the observed wavelength will be longer than the emitted wavelength. So then you would have to observe also at longer wavelengths or at lower frequencies. So that means if you want to observe hydrogen in the universe, you'll have to observe it at a frequency of 1420 megahertz or lower. And you know the ideal telescope to do all of this with is the GMRT, which operates at frequencies of 1420 megahertz and lower which is not uh, a coincidence, of course, because one of the science drivers for the GMRT was indeed to observe uh, hydrogen as it evolved across the universe. So as I said, this very well suited for observations with the low frequency telescope like the GMRT. All right, the, there is a catch though, um, you know, the, the, and the catch is that the H1 21 centimeter emission from distant galaxies is very weak. It's very, very difficult to detect uh, with existing telescopes uh, beyond the local universe. And, um, you know, the largest redshift at which currently H121 centimeter has been detected in a single galaxy is only about a redshift of 0 0.36. And that's quite low. Uh, as you saw, the cosmic noon is at about a redshift of one. So what you'd really like to do is to, you know, uh, try and probe what is happening all the way out, at least to a redshift of one or, you know, maybe even two or three to, to, to see what, what's happening to the atomic hydrogen as this uh, star formation rate evolves. And at 0.36, uh, you actually only have a, one individual galaxy. And what you would really like is to have, um, you know, uh, to understand the population of galaxies at these redshifts and not just, you know, have uh, a few uh, galaxies that you have observed. Now, very long observations uh, with telescopes like uh, the Westerbork radio telescope have been used to detect larger samples of galaxies, uh, but they're at still lower redshift, redshifts of about uh, 0 0.2. And I'm showing you a montage of, of a few of these galaxies over here. But, you know, these are very, very long integrations. Of course, uh, right now, uh, there are a number of new telescopes which have been built, and um, there are large uh, surveys which are either ongoing or will start in uh, short order. 
uh, with uh, telescopes uh, located in the Netherlands, uh, Apertif um, uh, in uh, Australia, ASCAP, and um, in uh, South Africa, which is a meerkat survey. And these will actually begin <clears throat> to uh, sort of uh, detect large populations of galaxies at these in this redshift range. But what we were interested in is what can we do early, you know, before all of these new telescopes come in and they've observed for the, you know, few thousand hours, etc. What is it that we can tell uh, about uh, the properties of the population of galaxies at these redshifts? So what can you do early? So uh, what we do is that we basically, you know, utilize the fact that the volume of space observed by a radio telescope at any, any instant. That is, if I pointed my radio telescope somewhere in the sky, it actually has a field of view. It doesn't just see one point, it sees an area in the sky. And uh, depending on the instrument that I have put behind it, which we would call the back end, and depending on uh, you know uh, how many frequencies you could receive in that back end at one given go, you can actually observe a, a chunk of redshift instead of observing just one redshift. So you can observe uh, uh, an interval in the redshift, you can observe an area in the sky, and that defines a volume of space that the radio telescope observes at any one instant. And that volume will contain a large number of galaxies. So even though you may not be able to detect any individual galaxy in that volume, you could statistically measure all of the, you know, the, the, the average content of all of the galaxies uh, in that volume. And one way of doing it is by simply aligning all of those spectra together. If you know exactly the location and redshift of each galaxy, you know uh, the uh, frequency at which the atomic hydrogen line would be expected. You can align all of these spectra together and try and detect that line using uh, the technique called stacking. So stacking basically requires one to use uh, the 3D position of uh, all galaxies to be stacked. That is two sky coordinates and one redshift. And you also need a fairly accurate redshift. You should know the redshift to better than about 60 kilometers per second. Otherwise, the line will get smeared out as you stack. So, you know, I'm just showing you over here uh, a cartoon of how that works. So let's assume you have three galaxies at three slightly different redshifts, Z1, Z2, and Z3. And here are the spectra from these three galaxies. And if you look at them, you don't see any uh, clear uh, emission line uh, from any one of them. But if you sort of, you know, uh, displace them such that the atomic hydrogen line is sort of aligned, and then you add them up, you can see that the signal begins to, to pop up. And you, 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 you see that there is indeed a little bit of emission uh, at the right place. Right? So this is the, the basic idea uh, behind what we are doing. And so the first proof of concept we had done for this was quite long ago. It was more than two decades ago, where we had done uh, very shallow observations of a galaxy cluster at a, a redshift of 0 0.1. Um, the idea was simply uh, to demonstrate that this technique works. And indeed, it does, um, that even though you didn't detect any individual galaxy, we, we actually make a very clear detection of the average properties. And you can actually um, you know, understand um, from this and by dividing it into subsamples, you know, things about how the atomic hydrogen in galaxies sort of uh, is affected uh, by uh, the hot uh, medium inside the cluster and as the galaxies fall into the cluster and so on. But I won't go into those details. Um, so anyway, but based uh, on that, uh, we did a number of surveys um, with uh, what I will call the old or the classic GMRT. Uh, and um, uh, we observed all the way out to redshifts of about 0 0.3. Um, but we had a, you know, a constraint over there that the old GMRT observed only a relatively small volume at a given time. And that's because uh, the, the bandwidth of the legacy GMRT was only about 32 megahertz. So that meant the region of redshift space that you could probe at one given setting was quite small. And uh, because uh, our volume was small, it hits us in two ways. One of them is that um, you, know, you have a smaller number of galaxies. And the second is because in any given volume, um, you know, the number of uh, small galaxies far exceeds the number of large galaxies. Large galaxies are rare, small galaxies are common. So if I have a small volume, most of the sample galaxies will actually be quite small. They'd be much smaller than what we call an L star uh, galaxy, which is a kind of fiducial uh, luminosity of, uh, of the galaxy population. And so most of our uh, sample galaxies uh, would be fainter than the fiducial luminosity of the galaxy population. They would have low uh, hydrogen mass, and that makes it tricky uh, to detect the 
the stack signal. So I'm just showing you uh, one of our uh, spectra over here, where uh, you know it's not even quite a three sigma, so it's sort of you know uh, at best a tentative uh, detection. But even though um, you know we don't have a, a strong detection, the um, you know the limits that we place on the uh, atomic hydrogen content per unit volume was actually very competitive for that time. So what's being shown in this plot over here is uh, the atomic gas per unit volume of the universe on the vertical axis uh, and the uh, redshift or the, sorry, the look back time, which is uh, equivalently the redshift parameterized in years on the, on the horizontal axis. And these various points are different measurements made by using different techniques. The black triangle is the thing which came out of the GMRT. And you can see two things. One, that it filled up a region of parameter space where there were no measurements earlier available earlier. And the second is that, um, you know, even though our, uh, we didn't have a strong detection, uh, the error bars of our uh, measurement was actually quite comparable to the available error bars at that time. So. You know, it was uh, a useful exercise, although we didn't actually quite end up with strong detections, uh, primarily because of the small bandwidth of the JMRT at that time. Um, as, uh, around the same time, Nisim and his collaborators also tried going a little further, tried to observe uh, using similar techniques, the H1 content at about a redshift of one with uh, ga galaxies uh, selected from a particular survey, the, a, the uh, Deep 2 survey, about which I'll get to a little bit later, but again, primarily because of uh, the small volume that the JMRT was able to observe at that time, we effectively ended up, he, he and his collaborators effectively ended up with upper limits. All right, so, you know, the, basically, as I was saying, we had a limitation with the old uh, JMRT. Its bandwidth was uh, small, 32 megahertz, which corresponds to a width in redshift space, delta Z, of only about 0 0.03 at a redshift of 0.3. And so, as I said, um, you know, a single volume occupied only a small volume of space, which hit us in two ways, a relatively small number of galaxies with known redshift in that volume to most of the galaxies which are in that volume are small and are hence intrinsically faint in H1 emission. So what would have really help uh, move this, um, you know, science along was the ability to image a larger instantaneous volume at one time. And that indeed is what the upgraded JMRT provided, and that upgrade finished uh, and was uh, sort of released about two years ago, and it delivered essentially an almost new telescope. Um, and I won't walk you through all of these things, but effectively to say uh, all of the things in that telescope, excepting for the concrete and the steel, um, have been replaced uh, with new components. And the big thing uh, that made a difference for us is that there were broadband feed antennas with low noise amplifiers. There was a new broadband analog fiber uh, optic transport system, a new broadband uh, analog uh, signal condition system, and finally uh, a, a broadband digital backend system, which delivered 400 megahertz of bandwidth instead of 32 megahertz of bandwidth. So as you can see, the bandwidth has increased more than a factor of 10, and that really makes a big difference. So if we compare uh, the uh, upgraded GMRT with the earlier GMRT, and over here I'm just showing you um, the, 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 the fractional bandwidth that the new uh, upgraded telescope uh, provides, and that's what given in, is given in these pinkish colors, whereas uh, the blue colors uh, give you uh, the fractional bandwidth that the old telescope provided. So you can see two things, that you get close to seamless uh, frequency coverage, uh, with the upgraded GMRT, there are still some gaps. Those gaps have been carefully put in regions where, in any case, uh, the interference is strong and useful observations are not possible. And also that at any one uh, band that you observe, the fractional bandwidth is quite large. It goes from about a fractional bandwidth of 0.7 at the lowest bands to a fractional bandwidth of 0.3 at the highest uh, bands, band 5. And so what I'll be talking about today is a project which has been running for the last several years using band four and band five of the upgraded JMRT. And I'll just uh, give a, sort of give one last blurb for the upgraded JMRT before I move into the project itself. Um, and I won't walk you through all of this, uh, excepting to say that um, these points uh, on this plot actually show you the sensitivity of different telescopes as a function of the frequency at which they operate. And the lower the point, the better the sensitivity. These pink points over here are the points from the JMRT. And so you can see that uh, they are, uh, you know, the lowest 
um, the, which points uh, that you have in that frequency range, uh, which means it's the most sensitive telescope in the world at that frequency range. There are a bunch of black stars which lie below the pink points, but those are basically what you would expect from the square kilometer array, which is not yet constructed, but which is expected uh, <clears throat> to come into operation towards the end of this decade. All right, so what we did then was to do H1 surveys with the upgraded GMRT, two deep surveys uh, in the redshift range uh, 0 to 0 0.4 using the band 5 receivers, where um, although we observed from 0 to 0 0.4 uh, because of the way uh, volume changes with redshift, the bulk of our observing volume is at larger redshifts. <clears throat> and we also observed with the band 4 receivers you from 0 0.74 to 1.45 in redshift. And these form the PhD thesis of Apurba, Vera, and Aditya Chaudhary. Apurba submitted uh, a short while ago, and Aditya submitted uh, earlier this year. <clears throat> and uh, the observations that we do yield measurements both of the H12 spectral line as well as the synchrotron radio continuum emission. And that is uh, very useful because the synchrotron radio continuum emission can be used to measure, measure the star formation rate. And so we measure not just the hydrogen gas content of the galaxy, we also measure the star formation rate in the galaxy from our observations. And we do both of these by stacking because the, uh, you know, the individual galaxies are too faint to detect. So uh, which are the fields that we observed for, the, uh, for these UGMRT surveys? They were selected from uh, redshift surveys done using the Keck uh, DEMOS uh, uh, instrument. Um, they're called the Deep 2 Redshift Survey. And we picked them because uh, for a number of reasons. One is that the survey area is actually a reasonable match to the GMRT field of view. So you get um, you know, a quite efficient use of the telescope time. There's dense redshift coverage. There's good redshift accuracy, 55 kilometers per second or better. And there's also good multiband optical photometry available in these fields, so which allows you to estimate from the optical also the stellar mass, the star formation rate, and so on and so forth. So uh, the, uh, the Deep 2 redshift survey had a number of fields. Of that one field, which is the ETS field, we selected for the high frequency or the low redshift survey, there's a redshift 0 0.54 survey, because this is the only field which gives us uh, good uh, co coverage of, uh, of galaxies at low redshift. The remaining fields were selected for our band 4, 0 0.74 to 1.4 uh, redshift survey, because in these fields, the redshifts were obtained not for all the galaxies in the field, but for pre-selected, color-selected galaxies in the field, to exclude galaxies with a redshift 0.7. So that worked very well for us. And so what it meant is that it gave us um, you know, a large number of galaxies which were exactly in the redshift range uh, that our receivers were sensitive to. <clears throat> so this is what Apurba Debera did for his thesis. Um, he observed the EGS field um, and um, you know, the, they had a number of galaxies with um, redshift accuracy, which was very, very good, uh, 30 kilometers per second or, or, or so. Um, uh, if you compare uh, the sample size that we had here compared to the earlier work we did with the uh, classic GMRT, it's a factor of five or more larger galaxies. Uh, than the fields which we had observed before. But, you know, there still was, it's still not absolutely ideal for the GMRT because, you know, the survey region in the optical was this long rectangular region, whereas the GMRT beam is the circle that you see over here. So, you know, the, that area was not a very, very good match to the GMRT beam, but still, nonetheless, it was a, a very fruitful field to explore. So um, uh, uh, Apurba had uh, redshifts available for about 445 galaxies um, with a blue magnitude brighter than about minus 17. These were also uh, sort of selected to be star forming galaxies. That is galaxies along the main sequence, which we had discussed right at the start of the talk. And the median redshift of the sample is about 0 0.34. And uh, so, one of the first things he, he did was to just do a simple stack, and he makes a very clear detection at about 7 sigma of the average H1 emission. And this is the very first statistically significant measurement of the H1 content of star-forming galaxies above a redshift of 0 0.2. So that was pretty exciting. And in addition, you also learn things about how the gas uh, evolves with time. You know, we find that the gas the galaxy is actually quite gas-rich. The ratio of uh, atomic gas to uh, stellar mass is about a factor of two larger than it is um, for, for local galaxies. So the galaxies actually have got a, a good bit more gas rich by the time you go to a redshift of 0 0.34. 
We had star formation rate uh, also measured from the same uh, uh, sample from, uh, from the radio continuum. And if you stack it, you could make a very, very clear detection of the stacked radio continuum from all of these galaxies. And so that allows you to measure the average star formation rate of these galaxies and hence the atomic gas uh, depletion time, which is the ratio of the atomic gas content, which we got from a spectral line observations to the star formation rate, which we got from stacking the continuum observations. And we we find that the gas depletion time is about nine giga years. So the gas depletion time doesn't seem to have evolved a great deal between now and about 0 0.34, although the gas content of the galaxy itself seems to have increased by about a factor of two. There's a great deal more you can do with the data, and Apurva very recently has um, uh, published a measurement of the H1 mass function. Uh, at these redshifts, and again, um, this is the very first uh, measurement uh, of the H1 mass function at these redshifts, and uh, we will very shortly be also putting out results on the H1 scaling relations, the gas accretion rate, and various other things that you might want to know about this population of galaxies. But, you know, let me move on uh, to talking about uh, a higher redshift sample. So this is uh, Aditya Choudhury's uh, PhD thesis, uh, where he uh, again took a uniformly selected sample of galaxies with RAB greater than about 24.1. Uh, with redshifts less than 1.45. And as I mentioned, um, the sample itself had been selected that it excluded galaxies less than 0 0.7. Uh, there were multiple fields uh, uh, where these measurements were available, well distributed across the sky. Um, and uh, that actually worked out very well for the JMRT also, because it meant we could do observations, nighttime observations, which are best as far as RFI is concerned, uh, throughout the year. So we started first with a pilot survey with just uh, 90 hours of telescope time uh, on five pointings. And uh, following that pilot survey, we did a much deeper uh, survey, a follow-up of 510 hours of GMRT time uh, on seven fields. Uh, so let me first show you um, this, uh, the results that we got from our pilot survey. Um, and uh, this really, I should once again sort of uh, uh, you know, talk about just how remarkable a job Aditya Chaudhary has done, uh, analysis of this sort, and particularly of these very large, uh, you know, volumes of data is completely non-trivial, but he really chomped through it, guided by Nissim at a very, very fast rate. And, and you know, he had uh, fairly quickly after the data was taken, uh, had produced this beautiful spectrum. Uh, a total on source time is only about 60 hours shows you the stacked spectra for about 7,500 uh, star-forming galaxies, that is, galaxies along the main sequence. And, um, you know, the 7,500, again, is almost an order of magnitude uh, more galaxies than had been uh, possible with the earlier uh, pre-upgraded GMRT. And that, of course, made all the difference. You'd make a very clear detection at about four and a half sigma of the average H1 red, uh, emission at a redshift of one. And that, again, now is a big jump because, uh, you know, earlier we had um, a single galaxy only at a redshift of 0 0.36 until Apurba came along and did this measurement at about 0 0.32, giving you the properties of a large sample of galaxies. And now here is Aditya taking this big jump in redshift and reaching a redshift of one. So this is the stacked image uh, of the uh, uh, of the of the H1 emission from the galaxies, showing you that the H1 is properly localized, as you would expect were it to arise in galaxies. Um, I'll, I'll you know I'll just show you a couple of uh, things that we've got out uh, of these observations. I won't be able to walk you through all of the results that are um, you know uh, that are uh, have been published and which are also several more which are coming out. But I'll just walk you through a couple. So one, let's first just ask the question. You know, wh what is the composition of galaxies? How, how does the composition of galaxies change as the universe evolves? Right? You know, so what fraction of the galaxy is in stars? What fraction of the galaxy is in molecular gas? What fraction of the galaxy is in atomic gas? And so the first time we are able to answer this question because we now have measurements of the atomic gas. Molecular gas and star stellar masses were available earlier, but we are now able to add the atomic gas. So if you look um, uh, 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 for galaxies uh, in the... Um, deep two sample, uh, the uh, stellar masses and star formation rates are available from uh, the optical um, observations. The molecular gas masses we estimated, 
by using a fitting formula uh, uh, on the, the, the um, uh, depletion time of the molecular gas. At, when we had looked at the uh, evolution of molecular gas, it sort of indicated that the depletion time was roughly constant. You can go one better than that and sort of get a fitting formula for the depletion uh, time of the molecular gas parameterized by the uh, stellar mass and the star formation, specific star formation rate. And so that allows you to estimate uh, the molecular mass for each one of our sample galaxies. And the atomic mass, which is also called H1, atomic gas is often called H1. And so uh, I'm sorry if I slipped into the jargon earlier without explaining it. When I say H1, it means atomic gas. So uh, the H1 mass, the atomic hydrogen mass, we get from our own galaxies. So this is what we see, that um, if you look at a redshift of about 1.4, you see that the bulk of the gas in mass in the galaxies, more than 60% of the mass in the galaxies is an atomic gas. And that fraction steadily decreases as you come down uh, to, to lower and lower redshift. So basically, the baryonic mass of star-forming galaxies at about a redshift of one is dominated by hydrogen, which is very, very unlike um, uh, the situation that you have at a redshift of zero. If you look at a redshift of, uh, of zero, the stellar mass is about 60%, and the atomic hydrogen mass is subdominant. It's about 30-something percent. Whereas if you go to a redshift of one, the situation is actually quite the reverse. More than, you know, close to 70% of the mass of the galaxy is now in hydrogen. So it means basically that, you know, the galaxies, the composition of the galaxies itself has changed quite dramatically uh, between redshifts of about one to redshifts of about um, zero. All right, we could also ask questions about the H1 depletion time. Um, you know, our observations are sufficiently sensitive that we can detect H1 emission even by dividing the sample into subsamples. And so what we do is we divide the sample into stellar mass bins, and um, you know, that allows us to measure the depletion time, which is the ratio of the H1 mass to the star formation rate. Basically an estimate of how long it'll take for the star formation to completely eat up all of the hyd atomic hydrogen. So we can make these measurements and we can make them also as a function of the stellar mass of the galaxy. And so we did it in two stellar mass bins with the subsamples appropriately weighted to make sure that the effective redshift distribution is identical. So we've sort of, in some sense, we've taken out the effect of redshift evolution and we are looking just at the effect of the stellar mass on these galaxies. And uh, so if you look at the, uh, at the depletion uh, time uh, in uh, these two um, sort of uh, uh, red, uh, stellar mass bins, uh, you can see this in the lower stellar mass bin, uh, you have uh, a depletion time of about, um, you know, uh, two giga years, whereas at the higher mass bin, the depletion time is slightly less than a giga year. And the blue points on the top of this plot show you the depletion time uh, of galaxies at um, uh, uh, at the current epoch at a redshift of about zero. And you can see that those depletion times are much longer. So basically the stars in the current epoch, the galaxies in the current epoch are eating away at their hydrogen much, much slower uh, than they were uh, at high redshift. At high redshift, the gas is being converted into stars at a really astonishing rate in less than a giga year or so. Unless fresh gas fall, flows into the galaxy, it will completely convert all of its hydrogen into stars. Right? That's what it means to say the depletion time is about a giga year. In a giga year, unless you put in by fresh hydrogen, all of the hydrogen that you have would go into stars. And so galaxies with stellar masses more than 10 to the 10 solar masses have extremely short uh, depletion times, just about a giga year. And these are also interesting because they are the galaxies which dominate the decline in the star formation rate. We saw that the star formation rate in the universe, the number of stars being formed per unit volume in the universe falls dramatically between redshifts of about one and zero. And if you ask the question, which are the galaxies which contribute the most to this decline, they are the galaxies with uh, stellar mass uh, greater than about 10 to the 10. Uh, namely the galaxies which are forming stars at such a fast clip that unless you put fresh hydrogen into them, they'll just uh, sort of completely run out of gas to convert into stars. So, um, you know, so that raises an interesting question. Is there gas actually inflowing into the galaxies uh, to sustain that star formation rate? 
or is there an insufficient gas flowing into the galaxy so that after about a giga year or so, it just cannot form stars at that rate and you know the star formation rate has to fall. And that again is a question that we can answer using uh, the data that we have. We split the galaxy sample now in redshifts, uh, and um, we can study uh, galaxies in two redshift bins. And I'm showing you the bins over here in this plot, uh, star formation rate on the vertical axis, redshift on the horizontal axis, and the optical measurements of various populations of galaxies in these different points. As we saw earlier, there's a dramatic evolution at high redshifts. You have a low star formation rate. It increases dramatically with a sort of flat plateau between redshifts of about one to three and then falls again. And the two redshift regimes that we are able to probe are shown in this blue and brown uh, bars. And you can see we are probing that very interesting regime, one which is in the plateau and the other is in the region where it begins to fall. That So we are able to actually ask the question, what's happening to the atomic hydrogen content of the galaxies in these two, 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 two epochs? And uh, so what we find is that <clears throat> Um, uh, we, we find uh, that the average H1 mass of the galaxies actually sh falls sharply by about a factor of three uh, between these two redshift bins. So that the galaxies uh, 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 in the higher redshift bin actually have three times more atomic hydrogen than the galaxies in the lower redshift bin. And so what that implies is that the gas is being converted into stars, but there's not enough infalling uh, from uh, the intergalactic medium to make up for that decline. And so uh, that basically is uh, insufficient. And so, you know, the galaxy will uh, quite quickly then uh, completely run out of gas and be unable to form stars. Effectively, <clears throat> what these observations are implying is that there's insufficient gas accretion to drive uh, the star formation rate uh, uh, that you see at the peak. And so the cause of the decline uh, of the star formation rate with redshift is um, basically insufficient star formation. So that brings me uh, to the end of my talk. Um, so I'll just summarize very briefly. We've uh, made very robust detections of the average gas content of galaxies with redshifts between 0.4 and 1.4. And that's feasible thanks to the capabilities of the upgraded GMRT. The surveys have established that galaxies at intermediate redshift are much more atomic hydrogen rich than galaxies at redshift of zero. In fact, they're so rich that atomic hydrogen dominates the baryonic mass by the time you reach a redshift of one. But even though there's so much gas in the galaxies, they're forming stars at such a fast rate that the depletion time is very short. Yeah, and very quickly, the galaxies run out of gas. There's insufficient gas accretion to sustain those star formation rates. And, um, you know, that sort of uh, is uh, our, um, our understanding of why um, the Thank you. Uh, I I missed the last part. Uh, I think uh, the you have ended the lecture, isn't it? That's correct. Yeah. I, yeah, yeah. I just <laughs> I, I, I the connection is bad somehow. Okay. Thank, okay. thank you, Professor Chengal, for your uh, very um, in-depth uh, um, uh, lecture, uh, starting from the basics of the uh, formation of galaxy, uh, star formation rate, and leading to the understanding of evolution of the uh, galaxy. Thanks also for sharing with us and discussing us with the new results from the upgraded GMRT. And now we move on to the next part of this session, um, which is the Q&A and in direct interaction with you. So uh, I would request my colleague, Dr. Manash Samal, to conduct this session and invite questions from the audience. Uh, Manish, please. Thank you, Professor Chengdu, for you know, giving a broad overview of uh, galaxy evolution and in particular uh, contribution of GMRT and currently the UGMRT towards understanding the galaxy evolution in H1 content. So I'm sure we have, uh, you know, uh, uh, people who have joined us through WebEx or YouTube panels may have some questions to discuss with you. So first, WebEx panel members to raise their hands. So I can take the questions, and in between, I will also try to uh, discuss with you 
questions that our YouTube viewers might have put. So I request the, all the WebEx panelists to raise your hands, please. Okay, so just to start with, uh, Professor Chenglur, you said that in, in your during your initial uh, slides that you know for galaxy evolution you need two or uh, two uh, theories you pursued. One is hot accretion, another is cold flows. Okay, so when when we study like you know star formation in our own galaxy, we don't often talk about you know hot accretion. So could you please? Uh, just you know give a little bit broad idea how this hot accretion could you know result into star formation what is that hot accretion actually <clears throat> yeah so when you're talking about star formation in our own galaxy actually the scales that you're looking at are completely different you're typically you're looking at molecular cloud gas cloud scales and you're asking how do they fragment and form stars uh, when uh, the uh, the point at uh, where the, when we are talking about hot accretion and cold flows, uh, the scale you're looking at is much different. You're looking at a galaxy-wide scale, and you're asking the question: How do baryons accumulate in uh, the disk of the galaxy? You know, how does the disk of the galaxy grow? How do baryons accumulate over there? And so there are two possible ways in which they could do that: that basically the gas which is flowing in gets shock heated and forms this hot ionized halo, and that gradually over time cools and and, you know, uh, starts falling into uh, the, the disk and so increasing the baryonic mass of the disk. Or you could have material which comes along a filament um, which doesn't get um, uh, he shock heated or ionized and these filaments could penetrate deep down into the halo and start delivering um, baryonic material much closer uh, to the disk of the galaxy, which are called cold flows. So these are the ways in which the baryons accumulate in the galaxy. Uh, and as I was saying, that those scales and things are, are, are sort of much larger than the ones which we are talking about when you ask the question, in our own galaxy, how does star forms? Because there you are literally asking, in a molecular gas, how does it fragment and form stars? Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. Thank you. So I see uh, um, question, I mean, your hand's been raised by Biris. Biris, you may go ahead. Uh, am I audible? Yes. OK, yes, yes. thank you, Jaram, for a very nice talk. Uh, see, uh, you spoke about that uh, measuring the star formation rate from uh, radio SEDs. So, uh, in fact, uh, we were studying some dust obscured galaxies and looking for Asian. So, we encountered a situation where uh, it becomes difficult to know that whether radio emission is powered by star formation or Asian, particularly in case of composite galaxies. So, uh, could you account that fact and remove the contribution of Asian uh, when you are doing this exercise? I mean, your student. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so the uh, uh, galaxies that we're looking on are basically main sequence galaxies and the radio emission that you expect from them, uh, if they were uh, to be um, powered by uh, star formation is significantly lower than you would expect for radio loud AGN. So, you know, just, uh, you know, uh, we can just ask the question is the radio emission that we see um, you know, bright enough for it to be an AG. And, and if it is, then we just chuck that out of our sample. And that's a small fraction of the galaxies that we have. Similarly, anything that was detected in the X-ray, et cetera, we just uh, said this could be an AG and we removed it from our sample. And it's a small fraction of the total galaxies in our sample. Okay, thank you. Okay, I see Kinsuk, uh, uh, you have raised your hands. Uh, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah, actually, it seems that the most of this H1 gas is being converted to star, right? Um, uh, yes, over time. So, so can you comment on the star formation efficiency? Yeah, well, uh, the star formation efficiency in some sense would be the inverse of the star formation rate or something, right? So, uh, uh, and again, I should be careful over here when I, I'm talking to people who do star formation rate because uh, there is probably a difference in terminology. Um, so, uh, you know, in this particular field uh, where we are talking about the cosmic evolution of star formation rate, the cosmic evolution of gas content and so on and so forth, uh, we literally just take the H1 mass uh, and divide it by the current star formation rate and the time scale that you get out of it is what we would call the depletion time. 
And of course, uh, people who uh, study star formation in retail in our galaxy and all that, they have a different kinds of measurements, which account for the fact that there's a fair amount of return of baryonic material back into the interstellar medium at the end of each uh, you know, cycle of star formation and uh, various other factors that they take into account. Uh, so what we do over here is simple and apples to apples comparison. We take the ratio of H1 mass to star formation rate in the local galaxy population. You take that same quantity in the high, high redshift galaxy population and you compare the two. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> Okay. So I see uh, Naval. Uh, uh, please go ahead. Hello. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, it was a very nice talk. So I have a question like why stacking is important. Like you are stacking the emission uh, of galaxies at different redshift. So in that case, the redshift, redshift information is lost. So like uh, for the, uh, like how uh, then we can uh, calculate the mass content of the gas. And in, in terms of that, like how we calculate the star formation uh, rate for yeah, yeah. So, um, so we, uh, you know, when we want to understand how things are evolving in redshift, we would actually uh, divide the area, the volume into redshift bins, for example, and stack over it. So that's typically how we would retain uh, the uh, the the effect of the redshift uh, evolution. And uh, you know, uh, if you, when we are computing the mass, we actually typically stack in luminosity, so that um, you know we've accounted for the redshift of each uh, bit as we're going along. So we finally get a proper mass measurement. Okay, thank you. I see Binit Rawat uh, uh, has raised his hand, so please, Binit, go ahead. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, thank you for the very nice talk, sir. So, sir, uh, you have shown that uh, the curve which, in which it is seen, we are seeing that the star formation rate was higher earlier in the higher red shift galaxies, and then it is becoming flat and going down. So, of course, uh, that you have shown that the atomic and molecular gas is also following the same pattern, kind of. So it is understandable, but apart from the gas content, uh, are there any the other factors uh, which are affecting the star formation rate and basically the conversion of the stars uh, from gas into stars? So I know that uh, uh, after the stacking and for a large samples, the small fluctuations and factors will get average out, but it's still, uh, but what could be the other, other possible factors which can affect the uh, declining star formation rate, but the possible? Um, so, so what we are showing over here is that, you know, uh, uh, on the larger scale, what's happening, uh, what appears to be happening is that, um, you know, the gas secretion appears to be shutting off at about a redshift of one. Um, that uh, up to maybe about redshift of one or so, gas is uh, flowing into the galaxies and then maybe the rate at which that flows in is decreasing and so, you know, that uh, reduces the star formation rate. Now, uh, in detail also, one would have to look, and I think this would be related to um, uh, one of the earlier questions about the efficiency of star formation and um, you know how how efficiently does a given amount of gas collapse into stars and so on so all of these factors would certainly play a role in individual galaxies and that itself depends on you know the dynamics of the gas in the disk uh, how stable it is and so on and so forth uh, and yes these are i guess uh, questions uh, for the future um, uh, uh, but you know the big picture that we uh, seem to be ending up over here is that um, you know there is um, the gas accretion rate itself appears to be a, a major driver. Yeah, because I am asking this uh, from the point of view like that uh, uh, because of the sensitivity issue, uh, the stacking is required. But what will happen if we go for the individual galaxy? Will it be followed in the uh, particular single galaxy or? we can expect some more variation depending upon other possible factors like that's why i'm asking this um uh, I, I mean uh, so the stacking is actually telling you the properties of the average uh, the average properties of the sample so i don't expect uh, that you know the uh, the average properties of the population as a whole uh, would change whether you detected the individual galaxies or not but were you able to detect the individual galaxies, you might well then be able to understand a little bit more about the phenomenology about uh, what all is going on. Um, uh, you know, maybe you would be able to understand uh, things better about the average sizes of these galaxies, the average uh, thickness of the gas disk, various things of that sort, uh, maybe something about the kinematics of the individual galaxies, which gives you further handles on, uh, on what all is happening as far as conversion of gas into stars is concerned. Okay, thank you very much.
Uh, so, Professor Chenglur, in this context, uh, in, the, in the end of the, your talk, you showed a very nice plot where we could see three breaks when you plot star formation rate versus red sheet. Okay. Yeah, so uh, do you require, uh, I mean, how can we explain the breaks, whether there is any physical meaning to those breaks? Yeah, so I should say that, um, you know, that uh, superimposed line was just superimposed by hand. It's not a, it's not some model which uh, was actually constructed and which uh, is put into the data. The data itself is those points that you see. And uh, it's a matter of taste, I guess, how you uh, parameterize it. Uh, many people parameterize it with a smooth curve. Uh, which was the parameterization I'd shown at the end of the talk, uh, um, at the beginning of the talk. At the end of the talk, I just showed you, um, you know, a different and more simplistic parameterization, which just, you know, brings out uh, the fact that it's roughly flat between redshifts one and three, and that, um, you know, above that there's a, a decline and below that there's a decline. But more should not be read into it. Okay, see. Thank you, thank you. I see a few posts from our, you know, from the YouTube, particularly one of our ex student uh, who wish to know whether do the star formation rate evolution is at the same rate as that of the molecular gas. Now he's asking about molecular gas evolution and yeah. star formation yeah. rate. Yeah. So as we saw, the molecular gas evolution um, has broadly similar trends uh, to the star formation rate. That is, the molecular gas content of the galaxies is. Uh, sort of appears, although the, you know, the uh, observations are still sort of preliminary, um, but, you know, the indications are that, again, that it has a similar behavior. It has a sort of plateau between redshifts of about one to three, and it is uh, lower uh, above and below that. So, yeah, the indications that uh, is that the molecular content of the galaxies is roughly tracking the star formation rate which uh, another way of saying it is that the depletion time is roughly constant. Okay. Yeah, thanks. So one of our students, Susan Dattai, he is interested to know whether the stacking his question is, is there any caveat in the method of stacking. Any caveats? Yes. Any caveats? Um, well, I mean, uh, I guess the first uh, limitation is that you don't learn anything about the individual galaxies. You, you just learn about the average uh, properties of the galaxy. So the advantage is that you can, um, you know, uh, go to higher redshifts or uh, uh, pick out fainter signals than you might have otherwise been able to do. And the disadvantage is that you, um, you know, you, you, you only learn about the averaged properties of the population uh, and you don't learn uh, about the individual objects in that population. Okay. I Thank you. We have well, I see uh, no more questions in the YouTube or as well as in the WebEx uh, panel member questions. Uh, uh, put by our uh, viewers and you know those who have joined us uh, in the Yonit Goswami to conclude the session and propose a vote of thanks. Vinit, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Madash. So uh, that brings us to the conclusion of the 73rd episode of PRL Kamrit Vyakhyan. So I would like to first thank Professor Jairam Changalur for accepting our invitation and giving an excellent talk on galaxy evolution, uh, the atomic hydrogen perspective in uh, today's PRL Kamrit Vyakhyan. And I would also like to thank him for answering the audience's questions. And uh, yeah. so next, I would like to uh, thank our audiences, both on the YouTube as well as WebEx platforms. Uh, and I express my sincere thanks to PRL director, Professor Anil Bhardwaj, 
Dean PRL Professor D. Palam Raju, and Chair of the PRL Kamrit Vyakhyan Committee, Professor uh, Nandita Srivastava, for all their su support in organizing this episode of the uh, PRL Kamrit Vyakhyan successfully. Uh, I also thank my colleagues in Vyakhyan Organizing Committee for successfully conducting the 73rd episode of the PRL Kamrit Vyakhyan series. I sincerely thank you all for being part of the Azadi Kamrit Mahotsav and PRL at 75 celebrations. Uh, kindly visit our website and other media platforms to know more about upcoming events being held at PRL, uh, in particular uh, PRL Kamrit Vyakhyan. And with these words, I would like to propose the closure of today's episode of PRL Kamrit Vyakhyan. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.